Hi, I'm Dr. Gwen, and my channel is all about creating content that empowers the neurodiverse community. In this episode, Dr. Samantha Valasek comes back onto the show to help us understand what interoception is and how it is our most fundamental sensory system. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming back Dr. Sam Valasek. Hi, Sam. How are you? Hi, Gwen. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great. Your um, when we did our last episode together, there was so much wonderful feedback, and for good reason, right? You are clear and um, a wonderful teacher to help us understand these concepts. And when you and I met the last time and spoke the last time, something kept coming up, but it just was outside of the scope of what we were talking about, right? And so I had to have you back. And so thank you for having or coming back uh, to the show. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, no, I'm jazzed. Awesome. Okay. So today we wanted to tackle what is interoception. Now, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that right. I've always said it that way. Is that how you say it? I, I, interoception. I don't know. Yeah. That, okay. That okay. Like to me. Yeah. And um, this has been coming up a lot. And, and I think as a psychologist, I'm so curious and passionate, passionate about developing someone's self-awareness because self-awareness really is the foundation for then self-management and how I live my life and plan my life, right? So this interoception piece is huge because I almost feel like it's precognition. <laughs> I'm not like pre-language, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over to you because you, you, but help us understand what this is. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good point about it being precognition. So what interoception is, it is um, our ability to feel our body from the inside. And in before I even delve even deeper into that, I'm going to first talk about last time we talked about sensory processing. And so that's that idea that we get information from our eyes, our nose, our skin, all of these senses that come in from the outside and those signals are sent into the brain and then processed so we can make sense of them. And that is so we can monitor our environment and assess it. You know, is it important? Is it friendly? Is it threatening? Um, what is it? And interoception is basically the same thing, but for all the signals from the inside of us. So what information are we getting from the inside of our body? And it's not just feeling what we're feeling on the inside, but also being able to interpret it um, and help make sense of it. So there are two types of interoceptive signals that we'll typically get. There are homeostatic interoceptive signals and affective or emotional interoceptive signals. And we'll break each of those down. So interoception, getting that information from the inside. So when I say homeostatic, I mean things that keep us in homeostasis or things that basically keep our body functioning and living and in balance. Um, so that way we can live and heal and grow. And so homeostatic signals can be things like hunger, thirst, you know, that urge to use the restroom. Those are all things that tell us, hey, you might need something. Go take care of your body, please. Um, and so those signals are sent, you know, there are receptors in, in our different organs and different parts of our body. And those signals are sent up to the brain. So that way the brain can coordinate action for us, can help us to be like, okay, that's important right now. Or, oh, we're going to suppress that one for a moment because something else is going on. But we need that, that back and forth for that homeostasis. The, the other set of signals are those 
affective or emotional signals. And those can have a lot of overlap with homeostatic signals. So we can have um, something like our heart rate slowing down in order to bring us back to a homeostatic state, or our heart rate could be slowing down because we're feeling a sense of ease. Um, or we could have this, something's going on in our abdominal region, you know, something's going on in our gut. Is it that we were just had food poisoning? Are we anxious? What's going on there? And when our interoception works well, we can tell the difference between what these signals are communicating to us and use that information to help us manage ourselves, our bodies, our emotions. Um, and when and that interoception is disrupted for any reason, either because of developmental differences or trauma can actually interrupt mm -hmm. our the way that all of that is processed. Um, so it's not that we're just born with different abilities around this, but it can change over the lifespan according to our experiences. Um, so basically if it's disturbed for any reason or different for any reason or we're just it can be cranked up to 11 for some things and then turned down to a minus one you know for others like oh, i don't i i don't know what it feels like in there it's a void you know i you know that sort yeah. of thing um that will affect our ability to know what's going on to uh, to make sense of it and then to act on it and if we don't know what's going on and we can't make sense of it, all, that's then all we're going to feel is anxious um, because not knowing is anxiety provoking in itself. Um, and sometimes it's it, it, for a lot of people when they're when things might be too subtle, they, they, they have a difficult time feeling into that. Only the loudest things are going to come through or the things that they feel the most frequently um, and very often anxiety and anger. Um, are going to be the things that they have the most access to. And so they might feel like I feel nothing unless I'm anxious or angry. And that's, that's really sad. And we want people to be able to have a, a fuller spectrum of feeling and be able to tap into themselves and use that self knowledge to take care of themselves. Yeah. And Sam, do you find, so like there's this kind of dance between, you know, nature and nurture, right? <laughs> we, how we're wired, how we're just kind of initially wired out of, out, out of the womb. And then all of these environmental experiences that shape the way in which we might be comfortable in the world or the way we might need, feel like we need protection in the world, right? Like, so we see, I can see how complex now this is becoming because we've got both of these things in this kind of interactive way. Is there a way to um, kind of turn, if the signal's too high, is, are there are there ways to turn down the signals or is there a way to, you know, maybe make sense signals more sensitized, if you will, because we actually need to be in touch with hunger or we need to be in touch with, ooh, affectively, this doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I want you to pay attention to that one, you know, um, and like, is there, are there ways to actually... Um, help someone with calibrating this maybe? Yes, there are. Um, so I'm going to introduce one new science term today just because can't help myself. Because um, it's you, because so. Sam and <laughs> <laughs> So there's this concept called self-directed neuroplasticity. So self-directed neuroplasticity is the idea that whatever we put our attention and effort into and we apply that consistently over time, our brain is going to change around that application of attention and effort. Um, so the idea neuroplasticity, the brain is plastic, the brain is changeable. And the self-directed part is what if we put that effortful attention. And so the brain really cares about what we really care about. So when we do something mm -hmm. self-directed, it's taking notes, it's saying, you know, oh, that matters. So we should organize around that. So that'll actually change the pathways in the brain when we pay attention to something in a particular way on purpose. That actually remodels our brain. But it's it's a slow process. So 
when we're thinking about changing something like interoception, it's so fundamental to the way that we operate. Um, there's, I'm going to say that we can make small changes to interoception. And like, I think really what's happening, the research has shown that, um, yes, we're, we can change the sensitivities a little bit. But what we can really do is help our brain respond adaptively to the sense to what we have. Um, mm. And, and we're going to change foundational things a little bit. And really, it's, it's going to be using the information that we do get more effectively. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And, and that's what a lot of the research and in sensory integration is, uh, is showing is that when we do these do these practices to help our brain make sense of what's inside or what's on the outside it's just taking its baseline what that information is what's what's going on there and helping it to respond to it more effectively and we can it we're going to make shifts in in our autonomic nervous system so the system that takes care of those automatic processes that's gonna that's really involved in those homeostatic things we can tune that up or tune that down with practice um but it's really in about how like it's that feedback loop between where we're putting our attention where we're how we're trying to influence our behavior and the signals that are getting you know sent up and down so it's it's mm -hmm. very active it can be changed what i will say is that it takes time and it, it does take a lot of practice it's not easy um but it is possible and i can give a little example of what that might look like yeah. um because I think that'll help people really understand. So, um, and I'm going to start with a, a place that feels safe in the body to do that. Because one thing is that interoception, when we haven't been feeling our bodies for a long time and we've been like floating heads, a lot of times when people start to touch into like, what's going on in my heart space? What's going on in my gut? That can be really scary because they can't tell the difference between excitement and agitation and irritability and anger you know the difference in tone or the difference in strength might not be obvious right away so we don't want to rush in and be like you know what i'm going to have you feel today i'm you've been avoiding feeling your body for decades let's go right in there to the scary spot um so what we want to do is start with some places you know we want to go as far away from the core as possible to get started and then work our way inward so we can start with our hands and anyone who's listening and is not driving, I invite you to maybe, if you feel comfortable, close your eyes um, and take a moment to close your eyes and you'll notice you might be able to feel, I'm gonna guide us down, um, down into our hands, allow your attention to settle into um, maybe the palms of the hands and noticing the fingers and we're going to start with from the outside can you feel cool or warm air on the skin of your fingers can you notice maybe your pinky in particular your ring finger your middle finger your pointer your thumb can you feel the entire surface area of your skin on your hands, the front and the back? And then you might take a moment to see if you can go and feel your hands from the inside. What do the inside of your hands feel like? Is there a buzzing or a pulsing? Is, do they feel light or heavy? There might be some achiness. There might be some stiffness. It might be really hard to feel anything at all for some people. Just feel your hands from the inside. And what we want to do is form some language around that, finding some words to describe what that feels like from the inside out. And take one moment and maybe even squeeze your fingers into your palm. 
and give it a nice tight squeeze and then relax the fingers and notice the shift in sensation that happens. There might have been a change in temperature or a change in pressure throughout the hands and the fingers. You might feel the way the skin is taut or loose and wiggle it out. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes or just, just that little piece. And that, you know, might people might recognize as mindfulness. Also, a lot of mindfulness practices do help us build interoception. Um, but starting with the hands and just coming up with that language for what does that feel like? That's the first step. And you would do that with there's actually an interoceptive curriculum that was developed by Kelly Mahler, who's an OT, um, that where she helps walk you through all of the different body parts, you know, and slowly moving closer and closer to the core, just being able to come up with descriptive words for it. So you know what that feeling, how you have to describe that feeling. And then the next step is connecting that to either a homeostatic state hunger or thirst or fullness or, you know, feeling ill or feeling well, and then also connecting it to affective or emotional states like, oh, that fluttery feeling, that's excitement or, oh, that sort of sweeping heaviness. That's what sadness actually is, you know, helping people connect those things, um, giving them that emotional language. So that way they can kind of decide in the moment how what what's going on and how can I take care of myself? I absolutely, well, first of all, I think you should do a meditation series, Sam, because your voice is like very relaxing. I was like, ooh, like I, f I felt myself just like relax. Anyway, that's totally, that's totally aside. But um, <laughs> what's great is, and, and I see this in the, even in the emotional psychological realms, um, which, you know, there's, there's so many, you know, you and I have spoken about like some of the overlaps, right. That you and I, um, that you and I experience as professionals, but providing a framework and then symbols to represent your framework mm -hmm. is what gives you the power or the agency to then do something with it, mm -hmm. right? And I, I really feel like sometimes just it's the formal, it's like a formal process is needed mm -hmm. in order to do that. And I see that even in the emotional, you know, the emotional landscape or the weathers, you know, like how do we, what are, what are someone's, what is someone's weather, you know, and how do we describe that? And even giving it a framework for that, that how really this really serves a foundation for so many other things that have to do with the quality of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. M being able to tune into this in the moment to moment every day, that is so important. Um, yeah. Really, it's not, it's not taking the two week vacation. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not like the big extravagant things that like self care is not really that stepping away, stepping outside of life for a little while, it is self-care is really paying attention to yourself in the day to day and being able to take, it's not two weeks, it's two minutes, that two minutes, that even 20 seconds of paying attention to yourself and being able to course correct. It's so yeah. hard to do, like we all don't do it all of the time, right? We're always, I mean, it's almost like human beings ability to delay gratification, like is a double-edged sword for sure, yeah. because it allows us to get these big goals met and build societies and things like that. And it allows us to really not pay attention to anything that's going on inside us for long periods of time. So yeah, I think, if we can build up that, whatever that symbol system is for ourselves, because you're right, not everybody's a verbal thinker. Mm -hmm. um, whatever that s system is, is of, of recognizing um, and labeling for ourselves, that's really important to be able to connect in and um, use it in the course of our days. Um, because if we get into the middle, I will say a common pattern that I see is part, particularly like school and work um, is that 
it's running into the anxiety of, ooh, there's something about this thing. And and maybe we don't even know that it that it's anxiety, why we're avoiding the thing. We're just like, I'm not getting started. I must be lazy. But it's really what we don't recognize is like, no, you think about the thing and then there's something going on inside. And if we don't recognize that that thing, that discomfort is actually the thing we're avoiding, mm -hmm. we won't know how to help ourselves. Um, because sometimes it's cognitive and we want to do, we can change our thinking about it and that helps, but sometimes we got to go somatic. Sometimes we've got to take care of the body because that's the foundation of, of everything else. And you mentioned earlier that, um, that you felt like, oh, this is, sounds like it's foundational to a lot of different things. It's precognitive. And I actually mm -hmm. want to loop back to that. Um, we, our thoughts, our brain developed to take care of our body. Bodies came first. Um, the ability to think, to, to form words and, and sentences and symbols is all to serve the body. Um, and we love having brains. It's a lot of fun sometimes. Um, but it's fun because the body gets to have this experience, you know, like uh, of, of, you know, fun and gratitude and those sorts of things. It's a, that mind body connection or really the, the lack of differentiation between the two, right? Like yeah. they're all one thing. Um, and so we develop language from what the body is able to experience. Um, and so that's why this is so important is yeah. without the experience of the world or of ourselves, we can't have language really. Yeah. And we just, we even know this in, in emotional, you know, when we feel emotion, which is we feel that milliseconds before our mind assigns a thought or words to it. Right. And so if we look at this as the first kind of level of information of signaling, right? How do we understand it? And, you know, as you're talking about this, it reminds me of a strategy that we use when we're trying to evaluate procrastination. Um, and, you know, procrastination serves lots of different functions. Um, sometimes it just serves the function of just promoting task initiation, right? I wait long enough. I have enough distress about it. And that's what kind of gets me to start, right? Um, guilty. I can say I've been there. I'm guilty of that. And, you know, but one is like kind of this um, emotional foreshadowing when you're writing down your to-do list or your steps, especially if you have a difficult time with, you know, sequencing, right? To really encourage someone to think about how it feels to start the task mm -hmm. is just so enlightening, you know? Mm -hmm. And so many of my clients will say, this is dumb, I'm like, no, 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 no. I really want you to imagine starting the task. Like, how does it feel in your body? Yep. And inevitably, we get a lot of information from that because now then it's like, well, now we know how to support you to start the task because the task is mandatory. Like, that's part of your job. You know, you, you can't avoid that. task. I mean, you could. It just has consequences that you might, you know not want. But I, I love this idea of, of how do we develop a lexicon, you know, a, a symbol, uh, some symbols, some whatever it is, right? It, it can be anything, but so that we know how to work with it. We can see it, we can work with it, you know, um, someone else can help us work with it. This is, this is so critical. I love that you put this in terms of self-care. I've always said time management is a self-care, is self-care strategy. <laughs> It's a self-care strategy mm -hmm. because when you don't manage your – or I, whether it's time management or energy management or effort management, when you don't do that well, you just put yourself in situations that now you're harried and frenetic and panicked and um, – or we've, you know, not taken care of ourselves for so long that, you know, now that neglect has led to something else. But anyway – this is, this is all important, but this is like, I feel like this is like first steps for first critical steps for a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. What I, cause I, here's the thing is I find that for a lot of people, if they, if they can't engage with 
this if you know if we're if we're not able to feel into like what's going on right now that's the thing that allows us to not manage our time because usually it's more like there might be the cognitive feelings like they're the cognition or like sequencing issues but very often it's because we've run into those sequencing issues so many times before that even if we have the capacity to learn how to sequence it's it's already like we're too afraid and that feeling if we don't are not recognizing that 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 repetition of past like other people telling us that we're getting it wrong and that we don't we're not connecting those dots um it's really hard to manage your time if you because the, the managing time takes care of itself it's how we feel about what we're doing with that time mm -hmm. and being able to manage our attention over time mm -hmm. and so if we're trying to if our attention keeps getting diverted away like we can't connect in to like how important this thing feels right because also wanting to do something is a feeling motivation is a feeling and if we can't connect into that feeling um then how are we supposed to you know it's really hard to initiate so i know in motivation and initiation are two different things yeah. we can be really really motivated and not initiate things and we can be really not motivated and initiate things they're actually mm -hmm. separate constructs but mm -hmm. it's so much easier to initiate something when we also can cue yes. into the motivation around it yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love how you separated those. That's got to be like another episode. I mean, we talk, you know, we talk a lot about motivation because, you know, people will say, oh, that person's just unmotivated. And it's like, oh, I wouldn't be so quick. You know, it's like, you know, um, or I got to wait till I feel motivated to do it. And it's like, oh, like motivation's a feeling. So I don't know when that's going to come by. You know, I mean, so this is, these are all like really beautiful. I, I love, I just love just you know, for the, for the audience, it's like, if you are even in any kind of, um, intervention, um, or maybe you, um, have a one-on-one -on -one at school, or maybe, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, you've, you know, you have someone helping you at home. Um, and, or if you're a parent listening, how do we understand the internal world? What are, I love how you said this. Mm -hmm. Interception is feeling the body from the inside. It, right? Mm -hmm. Sensory integration, outside in. Interception, mm -hmm. inside up. I'm going to say inside mm -hmm. up because because the brain's yep. up there. But anyway, so how do we then, you know, this is such a huge part and that history experience does shape you, this capacity. Mm -hmm. So let's really think about this. Um, and I, I keep in my very layman's terms, keep going back to the feeling of comfort, mm -hmm. um, and that someone needs to feel comfortable before they can be challenged. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And so if you're going to, if you are going to challenge someone to the edges or the outside of their comfort, they not only have to give consent, but there better be a dang good reason why. <laughs> why we're doing that. Mm -hmm. And boy, we got to be cued into this, to the, to this, this really uh, fundamental primal cue, if you will, the, this cueing mm -hmm. system. Thank you, Sam. Is there anything else we missed, Sam, that you might want to say about this? I just want to make sure we hit all the marks. Yeah. Um, I think that is it. I would say, you know, if I was going to say anything to people, it's take it slow uh, and practice it outside of doing anything else because we need it's it's if we're expecting ourselves to just get good at doing it like checking in with ourselves while we're in the middle of our day and you know we have other things calling us it's gonna be really hard so it does we do want to take a little a few minutes out of our day to practice these skills or work mm -hmm. with somebody, um, you know, on the somatic experiencing side of things, someone who knows how to guide people into queuing into this, mm -hmm. um, carve out time for it because, um, the more you practice outside of it and you can start to recognize those signals when you have the time and the space for it, the easier it gets to recognize when they're happening in the middle of things. But also recognize that that's not a direct tra translation. 
Um, if you can do it while you're calm and quiet, it doesn't mean you automatically can do it in the middle of things. There's going to be also then a next level of application effort to say, to set that intention to say like, okay, I'm going to focus on this signal. If I start to notice this signal during my task today, I'm going to do then pause and you know do whatever is going to work for me to manage that signal um whatever that signal means for me um so we kind of need what's called an implementation intention once we're translating that into real world implementation means if then if i come across this cue then i will and that mm -hmm. that is the next that's kind of how you scaffold this is practicing it when it's the only thing you're focusing on and then coming up with that implementation intention for real world application is like okay if i run into that heart racing feeling then i'm going to pause take a moment to either you know you can go cognitive and say i you know this is excitement relabel you know like okay yeah. i'm actually excited do this thing. I'm going to use this energy or pause and say, you know what? This energy is a little too high. It's not going to help me with this task. I'm, I'm going to actually come and bring it down because it doesn't. I also don't want to say that all signals that are elevated are maladaptive. We sometimes we want those elevated signals. They're going to help us. So I think that's the other thing is knowing what that signal means. And is it helpful in, in that in the course of that task or not? Yeah. It's almost like making an informed choice with information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, here's the information that my body is presenting mm -hmm. uh, and my nervous system is presenting. Mm -hmm. What do I do with this? And yes. in some level, you know, taking that observer, oh my gosh, I mean, like, boy, I mean, we've just kind of uncovered so many things, but, you know, being able to step outside of yourself and take that observer view on that is going to take practice. Mm -hmm. Ultimately though, I mean, you've said this word so many times, intention. Mm -hmm. The intention of where your attention is, is critical in building the skill, whether it's, you know, just working with the, the initial, how does it feel, um, all the way to that bridging of the implementation intention. You know, mm -hmm. we also hear this as maybe generalization or application, like these types mm -hmm. of things, um, that you got to start somewhere, you know, within any skill, you start with the vocabulary of it, and then mm -hmm. you can put it into, you know, you can put it into sentences and, and, and write with it and speak with it. But I love it. Exactly. Sam, I, you know what? You have such a beautiful way of helping others understand these constructs and these concepts. And you always help me understand it in a deeper, more robust way. So I thank you for coming onto the show and um, with your beautiful, gentle, encouraging spirit uh, to help people understand these things. So thank you for sharing your time and your talents with us, Sam. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Gwen. I always enjoy being here and look forward to next time. All right. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>